What's up, everybody? Welcome to BTM to the Basketball Time Machine, the podcast with former NBA players about former NBA players. Before we get to today's guest, just make sure you hit that subscribe button so you always get notified once you upload a new podcast. So today's guest not only played in the NBA, but also in the ABA. Len Elmore, welcome to the show. My pleasure. How are you, Sean? <laughs> Good. Can't complain. So to the younger generation, what was the ABA? The ABA was the American Basketball Association. It was uh, an upstart league that essentially uh, looked to rival the NBA. They recognized that there are an awful lot of really good players out there and not enough spots in the NBA roster. And some enterprising owners decided to start franchises throughout the United States. Uh, uh, what characterized the ABA more than anything else was a freewheeling type of basketball being played, wide open Uh, three-point shot, which was not a part of the NBA until, uh, I guess, the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, we also had the red, white, and blue ball, colorful players who worked at being characters, uh, obviously to set us apart from the more traditional, the more conservative NBA. And uh, quite honestly, it was just an awful lot of fun to play. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, I think was most important for people to realize is that After the first couple of years in the ABA, when I got there uh, in 1974, there was always a sense of doom every day, every year. Um, there was also a feeling that some team wasn't going to make it because they weren't financially sound. So every year teams had uh, players who ultimately had to leave because the teams folded from a business standpoint. So, you know, it, it was tough. Uh, but nevertheless, people took it in stride and, and played for the love of the game. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, but since this is way before my time, in the 70s, both the NBA and the ABA could draft a player, and the player at the end decided for in what league he would play. Is that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. And that became a bidding war, which ultimately uh, hastened the ultimate merger of, of both leagues because it just appeared that You know, teams couldn't afford it. That's what drove uh, a lot of the ABA teams out of business and, quite honestly, put a lot of pressure on the NBA. Uh, and it was a bidding war, quite honestly, that kept me uh, in the ABA. I was drafted in the first round by the Washington Bullets, now the Wizards. And also I was uh, picked and played and uh, picked in the first round by the ABA teams and the Indiana Pacers had my rights. Pacers offered me a longer-term deal for more money than the Washington uh, Bullets did, and I ultimately decided to go with them, even though the Bullets were kind of the hometown team, since I played only eight miles away um, with uh, the University of Maryland. Actually, it was the Baltimore Bullets, not the Washington Bullets. Yeah. The Pacers team, you just mentioned it, that was a loaded team. You had so many great players. Uh, the legendary George McGinnis was on that team. How was it playing with George? Well, I tell people all the time, everyone talks about LeBron James, his, his uh, physique, his capabilities, strength, quickness, athleticism. And I say that George McGinnis was LeBron before LeBron. Uh, people don't realize how big, how strong George was, but also how deft his touch was. You know, excellent footwork, he is a tremendous rebounder, excellent ball handler, uh, made the play uh, and assists whenever he needed to, you know, he just wasn't uh, a scorer. And I don't think George gets enough credit. Finally, he was uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame last year, but it took too long to absolutely. recognize his talents. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Dr. J was by far the biggest star of the ABA. Do you remember your first meeting with Dr. J? Yeah, actually, my first meeting with, with Julius Irving was not in the ABA. My first meeting with Julius was in a basketball camp Uh, up in, uh, I guess, in Massachusetts, out in the woods somewhere, where he was playing for uh, UMass, and I was still in high school, and we went up against each other. And, of course, being a high school player, never having played a guy six seven with uh, that kind of quickness and leaping ability, and he taught me a lot of lessons. Yeah, I can imagine. So you had a pretty good rookie season. You almost averaged seven points and six rebounds in only 18 minutes. 
But your breakout season was definitely the second season. You almost averaged 15 points and 10 boards a game. And your team was kind of special. You had like six players who averaged double figures. What do you recall of that season? Well, I mean, that second season was, I think, an important one, obviously, because I did finally get a chance to show what I could do. Uh, my first year, I sat the bench for a while until uh, Bob Leonard, our coach, our Hall of Fame coach, recognized that he had no alternative but to play me. And once I started playing, I think our, our unit started to mesh, and we ultimately made the playoffs and upset two great teams in uh, San Antonio Spurs with uh, Ice, uh, Iceman, uh, George Gervin, as well as um, uh, Mr. James Silas, the late Mr. Silas, as they say, and uh, went to the finals. We lost to the Kentucky Colonels. But that second year, I was able to start from the beginning of the season and recognize, uh, I guess, that I did have enough skill and talent to play professional basketball. What I remember of that season as we got to the playoffs again, but without George McGinnis, who had signed to go on to the Philadelphia 76ers, you know, we were kind of shortchanged a little bit. Uh, and coming up against a team like the Kentucky Colonels, who we lost to in the finals the year before with Artis Gilmore and company, uh, we just were outmanned. Yeah. Just hearing all those names of the guys who played in the ABA is unbelievable. So many legends. Crazy. Um, The following season, you only played six games. What happens? Well, in uh, training camp, here I was on the verge of having hopefully another breakout season, and I tore uh, my medial collateral tendon and uh, my uh, anterior, I guess, no, it's the exterior, outside, uh, meniscus. And I was pretty much out for the season. I tried to come back with a huge brace on my knee, and I played six games but recognized that I just couldn't do it and so you know my season was cut short which was uh you know sad for me it was a debilitating injury and you know I never could quite return uh from it to play the way that I was accustomed to playing I did have to make an adjustment fortunately I did and you know played seven more years after that but nevertheless the the injury you know put a, a huge damper on on my career yeah You think if you would have stayed healthy, you would have been an NBA All-Star? Um, possibly. I mean, I, you can you can never say never, but I also don't want to, you know, anticipate. I I, I would have been a, a very good player still. Uh, you know, my numbers the year before kind of spoke for themselves. And getting into the NBA, I remember us scrimmaging NBA teams while still in the ABA, and I certainly, you know, had a way uh, to to really, I, I guess, affect some kind of uh, positive impact on my team. But to be an all-star, who knows? Okay, I, I say yes, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1976, the ABA and the NBA merged. For many ABA players, it was a very tough time because of the uncertainty. How was that time period for you? Uh, I wasn't worried. I, I remember I mentioned before that I had signed a long-term contract with the Indiana Pacers. And one of the reasons I chose the ABA team was because uh, I did my homework along with my representative and recognized that they were a very financially solvent team, that they would survive any type of merger. And because of the, the love of the game among the fans in Indianapolis, there was no way that the NBA did not want that franchise to be you know, in their association. So I, I was still on the Pacers. I wasn't worried. I had a guaranteed contract. And... Um, You know, I was actually happy that the uh, the wars between the leagues was over and we could get back to focusing only on basketball and not worry about who's got, who would lose jobs because the teams would uh, go insolvent. Yeah. Do you have any funny ABA story? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. Some of them are not for public consumption. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> 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 but but there are, there are a lot of interesting stories um, in trying to make the league more palatable. I remember um, with the officials, you know, they recognized they needed to keep the superstars in the game. And I remember being on one side of the lane in an important game. A foul was called. The referee looked around and turned and pointed at me, the rookie, and said it was on me. And I said, wait a second. You know, I was nowhere near that play. And I remember we didn't have replay, mm -hmm. and the game wasn't televised. And so a guy comes up to me and says, 
you know, George has three fouls. You want me to give him his fourth? You take it. And, of course, I did. Uh, but, again, some of the politics that were involved in trying to keep the game palatable. I, I can tell you how many times we um, had some enormous travel responsibilities. We played a game in Denver, uh, a night game in Denver, a 730 game. Uh, finished at, obviously, 930. By the time you get out of the locker room, it's 1030. You have to find something to eat. So you go eat, you go to bed, because the next day we had a 6 a.m. flight to New York because we had an afternoon game with the New York Nets. That's how difficult the travel was. I mean, I got probably two hours sleep that day. And, of course, if you're a gambling person, you always knew to bet against the road team after a trip like that, and which it would have paid off. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> In 1979, you played one season for the Kansas City Kings before you joined one of the most underrated teams of all time, the early 80s Milwaukee Bucks. Tell me about that team. Well, the Milwaukee Bucks team was, uh, you know, if you took a look at the personnel, uh, a bunch of all-stars and ex-all-stars. I, I remember when I... Uh, When I got to that team as a free agent, when I left Kansas City, which I was kind of uh, unhappy that I did have to leave Kansas City, but it was a, an expansion year. They protected seven or eight people. Um, I felt that there might not be a place for me, even though I was told there was. And Milwaukee offered me a decent contract. And because they were a perennial um, playoff team, I decided to take my chances there. Uh, when I got there, I was amazed, as I said, at the talent. I, we have Marcus Johnson, who his, his jersey still hasn't been retired. It's in ridiculous. Which I think is absolutely. That, that's, that's crazy. Because he's one of the best players I ever played with, and, and I played with a lot of them. But, um, you know, we had Sidney Moncrief, who was Rookie of the Year the year before. Um, then, you know, solid players like Brian Winters, who was a friend of mine from New York. Um, Bob Lanier, obviously. Yes. Who, was kind of on the downside of his career, but nevertheless, you know, Bob was still a, a force to be reckoned with. And then Junior Bridgman, uh, who was one of the top six men in the league, uh, who now is a billionaire uh, as a fast food magnate. Um, and, and we had a lot of guys, Mickey Johnson, myself, uh, a guy by the name of Mike Evans, Pat Cummings. Um, we had some really good role players out there. And this is a team that won 60 games. It, it was a lot uh, of fun. Yes playing with them no question and winning 60 games when the east was still loaded you had the boston celtics that, that yeah. season you had so many great teams so winning 60 in the east back then that was tough yeah and i forgot quinn buckner i have to add quinn's name otherwise he'd probably hear this some way or another and choke me so <laughs> <laughs> yeah you already mentioned uh sydney won the rookie of the year award Uh, the following season in 1981, you played for the New Jersey Nets and you went from one rookie of the year to the next, Buck Williams. Yeah. Well, I mean, New Jersey Nets, is, uh, I can look back at my experience as a professional athlete and say that was probably the most fun that I ever had as a pro basketball player. Um, you know, I left Milwaukee. Uh, I was traded to them right before the season started, actually after the first game. I got to New Jersey, uh, you know, a rookie-laden team. I, I came off the bench in my first game with them, which was their second game. I got 14 points, 11 rebounds, and from then on, I became a starter. An interesting part about that, and I think people need to check the record books, is that, as you said, we had a great rookie, and Buck Williams had another rookie by the name of Albert King. And what that wound up doing was giving the New Jersey Nets uh, a team – of frontline players, frontline starters, all of whom went to the same college. Buck Williams oh, went to the wow. University of Maryland. Albert King went to the University of Maryland. I went to the University of Maryland. And every time they announced this uh, on the public address system, it was fun to hear, you know, and from Maryland, number 52, Buck Williams. <laughs> and from Maryland, number 55, Albert King. And from Maryland, number 44, Len Elmore. It was nice. Oh, man. I don't think, I don't think that's been replicated for you know that amount of games i think i played 79 games that year um and i don't think we all started together i don't think that's ever been replicated for that many games in the nba <laughs> in, but let, let me add yeah i was gonna say let me add that you know we played for larry brown 
Uh, Larry Brown, if people recognize he's, he was obviously a great coach, but um, he was probably the best coach I ever played for in that the way he taught the game, the way he focused on fundamentals. In practice, we never did more than we were going to do in a game. We always were in a position to, to excel in the positions we were put on the floor to do. We mm-hmm. started out 2-14 and 14 because we were a young team with a lot of uh, ACC, Atlantic Coast Conference, college players on the team. But we wound up winning 40-some-odd games and wound up making the playoffs that year, which I think is a tribute not only to the coach but a tribute to the players, the older guys like myself and the younger players who kind of pulled together and had great chemistry. In 1984, you had your last game in the NBA. So in hindsight, who was the best player you ever played against? The best player I ever played against yes. uh, had to be, you know, had to be Kareem. I mean, I, I mentioned playing head up against him. I, you know, had to guard him. And there were some other great players that, you know, I guarded off and on. I mean, I was matched up with Larry Bird on occasion. And, you know, that uh, obviously he was uh, an outstanding player. Um, you know, Julius, uh, even George Gervin, people like that. But. Overall, I guess my toughest opponent, um, Artis Gilmore, was one of the biggest and strongest guys I ever played against. But if you put everything together, my toughest opponent was Kareem. And, you know, I never worried about matching him and scoring because that wasn't going to happen. But, you know, I had other ways to be able to thwart uh, his genius. And some days when we played against each other, I, you know, I had my way too of offensive rebounding and blocking some shots, doing some things. But, You know, you had to stand and you had to marvel at his talent. There's no two ways about it. Who was the best teammate you ever had? The best player you ever played with? Oh, uh, the best player I ever played with. Let me see. Um, it's it's probably a toss-up. I mean, I only played one year with George McGinnis. I only played one year with uh, Bernard King. Oh, um, oh he's know, so underrated. Are, Bernard is so yeah. underrated. Oh, no question about it. You know, Bernard, uh, despite his scoring capabilities and heroics he was still a, a, an excellent team player uh, so you know between the two of those guys I think um, you know you'd have to say that they had to be the best players that, that I ever played with okay that, that sounds fair uh, you, you mentioned Larry Bird earlier um, you played against Bird and Magic what was so special about yep. them uh, their competitiveness I mean obviously their skill Uh, they were head and shoulders above most players, but their competitiveness, they never took a playoff, constantly looking for ways to beat you. Um, whether I could play on the floor with them on the floor at the same time, whether I was matched up against them or was sitting on the bench and watching them, they had that fire in their eyes that, you know, they didn't care if they were playing checkers, they were going to beat you. <laughs> All right. So you played in the wildest era of all time, the 70s, and probably the best era of all time, the 80s. What decade was the more important one to uh, you? Um, I would say that, you know, each one of them had its allure. I mean, in the 70s, particularly early part of my career, I was able to play more minutes. And before I got hurt, you know, I was really you know, starting to make my mark. And uh, I was... Unfortunately, I had that cut out from under me because of the injury. But, you know, make no mistake about it, being able to come back from the injury to rehabilitate and get back to a point where I could get regular minutes again, um, where I've seen a lot of other guys who have gone down with the same type of injury never really came back. So, you know, I, I have some pride in, in, in that era uh, because of the work that I put in. And in the 80s, um, You know, I'd have to say that I played on some pretty good teams, particularly the New Jersey Net team that, as I said, overcame starting out two and 14 and wound up winning 40 some odd games. You can see the growth in the young players. Uh, a lot of it was directly attributable to the impact that uh, some of us seasoned veterans had on them, as well as the, the input that we could have with our with our skills. So, you know, that was very satisfying. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's really, I guess, what marks um, my, uh, I guess my desire to say that both of those eras were pretty good because of the self-satisfaction I can take from them. If you would have played in the 90s, what would have been your team? 
Wow. <laughs> uh, you know, it's hard to say. I, I don't. I don't really know. I mean, I, I probably couldn't have played on the Bulls, but you know, although I, as a role player and someone who understand who understood the game, I probably could have fit pretty nicely on that team. Um, you know, I, I just. I, I would have just about been happy to play anywhere, to be honest. <laughs> oh, I know a couple of teams you probably never would have loved to play on. Uh, really? Name some. You would have you would have liked to play on the Clippers in the early 90s? Hey, it was L.A., man. <laughs> no, you're, you're right. There are some teams that I, I don't care who you would have. You had, you needed two or three superstars to pull them out of uh, uh, the cellar. But it, it would have been tough to lose. Um But yeah, I mean, playing the game it was a privilege, and you know, winning or losing experiences, you still have to recognize that you were one of the best uh, around if you were in the NBA at that time. And you know, now having the ability to look back on it, you have to take pride in that fact. You look at how many teams are in the league today—30 teams, and back in my day, there were far less teams, which meant far less uh, available opportunities to be in the league uh, you know i tell people there are a lot of guys playing basketball today that wouldn't have made teams in, a, in my era in the 70s and the 80s so you know you take satisfaction in that once your basketball career was over you had a great law career as well as a broadcasting career did any job ever give you as much satisfaction as playing basketball uh yeah both of them did i You know, as, as a lawyer, particularly when I was uh, an assistant district attorney, which is a prosecutor in, in New York City, you know, doing good uh, for your community uh, without being, um, you know, a uh, without being a, a menace to your community, as unfortunately some law enforcement officers have been. Um, you know, I, it's, I think we serve them very well in trying to do the right thing, trying to balance the community, keep it safe. Uh, so, I, you know, I got satisfaction out of that as well as, you know, running my own sports management company where I was an agent for about five years. Uh, we helped a lot of players and have guys now to this day that thank me for the experiences that, that they learned and received, you know, under our, under our banner, a uh, company called Precept Sports and Entertainment. And uh, as a broadcaster, certainly I still enjoy it, uh, teaching the game having a bully pulpit to speak to the values that the game should represent, particularly the college game. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think we've developed here in the United States a warped opinion of what college basketball is all about and what should be about. And, you know, I get an opportunity uh, when I'm on television to try to, you know, espouse the values that I think the game must be about in order to serve the young people well and to serve the fans well. Off topic, in the 70s, what record was playing on your record player? Oh, man, uh, just about everything. <laughs> I have it. I could give you a list right now on my um, on on my uh, my t my phone right now. But my uh, my playlist went from, you know, jazz, uh, which, you know, I got the taste from my dad and, and particularly con uh, at that time, contemporary jazz. You know, whether it was Dizzy Gillespie, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, singers, great singers of, of that time. Dizzy Gillespie, John Coltrane, uh, Monk, people like that, all the great singers. My father loved Sinatra, oh, yes. loved Billy Eckstein. But also, I was listening to, um, you know, anything that was uh, funk, R&B. Uh, you know, we sit here and as we drive up, my wife probably gets sick of me singing. I got the... <laughs> Uh, one of the, the oldies stations on Soul Town and, and on Sirius F S XM and listen to those songs. And I can't believe I know the words just to just about everything on there. Uh, so, you know, that's really what what and I continue to listen to that. For me, music stopped right around the early 80s. I think, you know, Michael, Michael Jackson uh, with Thriller and, and that album and some of the others might have been the end of it. Although I listen to a little bit of stuff of recent vintage But uh, more than anything else, I got to listen to that. I thought you'd be a Earth, Wind, Fire guy. I am. I, I told you, anybody that was in the 70s and 80s, man, uh, you know, and it even goes back beyond that, be further before that. 
but R and B and funk, you know, um, George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelic, all of those. Yes. That's, uh, that's the way it works. Do you have a favorite movie of all time? Yeah, I mean, my, I still think the number one movie of all time is The Godfather. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a movie aficionado. There are, you know, several things that I like, but when you make comparisons, I think Francis Ford Coppola kind of captured everything in that particular movie. All right. So my last two questions. If you would talk to somebody who who's never seen basketball, and you would have to point him to to watch one player, to go on YouTube and to watch one player, who would that player be? Wow. <laughs> oh man, you know it would it would have to be a composite of great score, great team player. You know, somebody who was unselfish but nevertheless uh, had the ability to take over a game. I mean, whether it's Irvin, you know, Magic Johnson, um, you know, I'd say Michael Jordan in his, his heyday. Uh, I'm not sure there are many guys today that I would point to and say, oh, absolutely not. You know, that's a prototype. Yeah, I would say that that's a prototype. But, you know, the guy who might come closest to that would be Kawhi Leonard, who plays both ends of the floor. Uh, but, you know, those are the guys that I would think you want to dominate. And if you want to look at specific positions, you know, I would look at, um, you know, Kareem, uh, Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain for different brands of center play. You want the power guys, I'd have George McGinnis or I would have Carl um, Malone. And obviously guards, when you're looking at guys that distribute The Stocktons of the world, the nice. Irvin Johnsons of the world, um, you know, those guys. Or if we're looking for shooters, you know, knock down deadly shooters, Reggie Miller, people like that. So I like um, your taste. Yeah, well, I mean, but but the composite guys, I, there aren't many of them anymore. I, I would have picked Larry Bird, to be honest, even though Michael Jordan, to me, is the best yeah, player I've ever Larry. played. But Larry Bird yeah. was all the all the um, all the aspects you just mentioned, like like yeah. not being selfish, uh, playing defense, being able to take a game over. You just described Larry Bird. Yeah, no, I, there's no question about it. I mentioned his name. Um, I said Larry and, and Irvin. I mean, those two guys, especially when they were at the, the pinnacle of their careers. Um, and, you know, Irvin could the last shot. Of the game, even though he wasn't known as a great offensive player, if I had to get a last shot, remember, I don't know if you ever saw the playoff game. I think it was an '85 when he gets the last shot and the throws up a, the baby a sky hook. hook. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I mean, you know, this is a guy that's your point guard, you know, and the final shot of the game, you put him down on the post, and he throws up a shot that is vintage, uh, you know, surreal center play. So, I mean, you talk about being able to play just about any position. That's what made him so so wonderful to watch. So my last question. Okay. Who's the player where you're really sad about that you never played against him? Uh, that I never really played against him? Yeah. I, you know, I, I would have liked to have played against him even though, you know, it would have been interesting to match up with him if I was in my heyday. I mean, I would have liked, loved to have played against and maybe even with Bill Russell, um, simply because I used to pattern my game from a rebounding, shot-blocking standpoint off of what he was able to do. I had a chance once to play against Will Chamberlain, even though it was in a charity game, and I got my fill of that very quickly. That's the strongest man I've ever <laughs> played against in my life. Um, but... You know, so he's one guy, and you look at some of the so-called stars out here, uh, and particularly of recent note, and I wonder, you know, what would we have done, particularly I fashion myself as a pretty good defensive player, what could I have done against, you know, some of these uh, so-called big men who are all-stars getting paid triple-digit millions of dollars, uh, DeAndre Jordan, um, who else some of these other guys I got a feeling they couldn't play in our era oh absolutely not absolutely not <laughs> uh, to be honest um, one, of, one of the reasons why I'm so 
uh, why I have such a hard time watching today's basketball, to me, the big man, the classic big man is dead. There are yeah. no proper big men's gone. Well, it's the idea of that stretch, that stretch four, or even having your five standing out there and shooting threes. I mean, I used to shoot uh, jump shots as well. It was inside the arc, but I was drawing the bigger centers. I was a smaller center. So I had to draw some of those, those guys out, and I had to stay on the move in order to get opportunities to score. But you're right, the classic big man with the drop step and the hook shot and you know the classic pivot play, they don't teach that anymore. A lot of it is copycat. Um, you had a couple of Euros come over, like uh, Dirk Nowitzki from, obviously, Germany, <coughs> who had great success at seven feet tall, but suddenly everybody wanted a player like that. And, you know, we've evolved to the point where, you know, every big that comes out of college, even in the United States, most of them are trying to step out and shoot threes instead of going inside and flying their trade. Oh, it's terrible. Actually, the, the only guy that I really like, the only big in the current NBA is uh, Joel Embiid, because he actually still has a good post game, even though he shoots threes. Yeah. He knows how to play with his back against the basket. Now, if he only... You know, exercise a little bit of humility and play the game harder yes. instead of trying to draw attention to himself. Uh, you know, that team would be even better served. But there's no question about it. Embiid has got, he's got all the tools. There's no, there's no arguing that. Len, thanks a lot for being on the show. It was a pleasure having you. Hey, same here. Save it for another episode. All right, man. Take care. Road.